I'm going to do is entangle self-portrait, sort of from beginning to end. I hope that everyone has been practicing their entangle doodles and coming up with different patterns that they're comfortable with and practicing others and finding sources for ideas in zentangling and doodling. I want to go over methodology, and that's what this is going to be mostly about as we go through this portrait. You can see here that I'm using a projector to trace around the basic planes and shadows of my face from this picture that was taken of me back in 2012. There are many ways to aid in creating contour line drawings like this. Quite often I have students or myself use a grid. There's also the X plus diamond method, which is very similar to grids. Sometimes we transfer directly using carbon paper or graphite on the back of a piece of paper. Sometimes we poke holes in things and ponce them with charcoal. And in this case, we're going to use the camera obscura method, which the camera obscura was a device invented back in the 1500s that artists would often use to help them create renderings of objects by projecting them on a surface. You can see that I'm using a standard graphite pencil and I'm making light lines around the basic features of my face. Eyes, nose, my chin, my mouth, my ears, my neck, and even my clothing. Trying to get the basic details in contour line. Sometimes I worry about where the shadows are when they're particularly dark, like inside my ears or in my eye sockets. But most of the time, I'm just going around the features wherever I can. And in this case, there's not a lot of hair to worry about. All told, it took me about five and a half minutes to create a contour line drawing. That doesn't mean that I was entirely finished. When I pulled it off, I needed to clean it up a bit. And to answer your obvious question, yes, I have sped this video up at least double speed, probably a little bit more than that. Here then is the cleaned up version of my contour line drawing. Notice that there are a couple of shadows that I focused on, but for the most part, it's just the facial features. Um, my lips, eyes, nose, ears, the shape of my head, where my hair is, and in this case, my mustache, because I had one then and the clothing, the folds, those are the basics. That's all I need at this point. Here I'm going to break it down a bit and I'm going to look at the basic shapes that I have created with the shadows and with each of the facial features. I'm going to start zentangling in them. I've sped this up to about 20 times faster than normal, so you will see me going at incredible speeds that are, people are not normally capable of. And I'm going to create some patterns. I need to realize that whenever I create surface line across the feature, I am creating a direction to those lines. So I want to be aware of my directions. And in this case, I'm interspersing different zentangle patterns where my hair is, or in this case, was. And I'm actually getting it darker than the original. I don't have to do that, but there's not much to see up there, and I really want to focus on the outline of my head as well. And there are some places where the lines sort of break and the shapes didn't quite come through, so I can spill some zentangles out from there, keeping with the edge of the shape of the head and trying to stay sort of within that hairline area. I'll do the same for the mustache and the eyebrows, you can see here. And I'm going to put some of the details in around the eyes. I'm even zentangling into the pupils with some straight lines and trying to keep some of the highlights in the eyes as well as I go through. And you can see that the different patterns, they make a value across the surface. And that's really what I'm looking for, is a very graphic look, lights and darks, and where I'm working with. And then I'm going to repeat some of the shapes and the line forms around and just entangle different areas of the face. Have some fun with it. Try to keep those lines showing directionality try to keep them within the proper value range if you can, but we're going to go away from that in a little while too and just sort of put some random areas of geometry in the face after a bit. Eventually I end up with the outside edges of everything outlined in some way. Most of it is entangled to the edge 
or just a simple outline around the outside of the face. You'll see that there are some shadows, say under the chin area and that area of flesh that we don't often want to be a double chin underneath that I've made darker because there are darker shadow down there. And then I've entangled a bit into the surface as well all around so that there are different shapes and patterns that sort of poke their way through. Now I've been zentangling little bits and pieces, but I thought I would break this up in some geometric shapes. So to do that, I'm using my pencil at this point. I don't want to use a pen because most of these lines I want to go away. And I picked a central spot someplace between my eyes, and I'm making a pie chart on my face. Or I'm just making radiating lines around that central area so that I end up with sort of a radial symmetry in this case rather than a bilateral symmetry or a symmetrical, asymmetrical look at the face. I'm going to play with that and then I'm going to break up the background, I'm going to break up various areas into different size chunks that are just very geometrically interesting. I could do this with circles if I wanted to use a compass that would be nice too. In this case I'm just going to use a straight edge. You can see here that I use the pencil to break things into different geometric shapes. I have that radial pattern out across the face along with some stripes going in different direction. I have stripes across the neck, stripes across the background, and now I'm working in here to make sort of a checkerboard with this tone that I'm putting across the surface. This is a very comfortable pattern for me. It's a thatch pattern, and I can use it over and over again very easily. So I'm putting that down here on the face, like I said, in sort of a checkerboard pattern, but that checkerboard is radiating out from the center rather than being squares. And then I'll work into some of the other areas around it with a different value of pattern. And in this case, I have a darker value in the checkerboards and then lighter values in some of these other entangled areas around it. And you can see that I'm building up different patterns across different areas. And I'm just using the face like it's one big shape with many shapes within it. So I'm going to break this up. Eventually I'm going to shade on top of this using graphite and it's going to give me a very interesting graphic look as if I were tattooed from top to bottom. At this point the only reason that I still look sort of human is the fact that I focused at the beginning on the hair, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, the shape of the head, the shape of everything else. Those shapes are going to give me that human element that I want. So the first thing that I did was I broke down the forms of the face into more flattened areas and then I zentangled rounded and form-like areas into them using surface lines. I also paid attention to the sorts of values that I was creating with those zentangles so that later on I could come in and shade them. I then broke the face down into more random geometric shapes and I zentangled each of those areas using lines that sometimes went with the surface and sometimes went against it. It depended on the pattern that I was using in each of those spaces. At this point I wasn't giving much thought to value, I was giving more thought to pattern and shape as I filled all of the spaces in. At this point however I'm going to go back to value and as you can see I have an ebony pencil here which is equivalent to a really wide lead 2B darkness pencil and I have here a picture of myself, the same picture in which I have increased the contrast and heightened the lights and darks considerably. I did this by creating a grayscale image from the original picture and then I increased the contrast I changed the levels on the picture to make the whites very white and the darks very dark. And I just played with that until I ended up with an image that I could work with that had extreme lighting effects. Pretty much any app that you work with that deals with photographs will allow you to do something along this line. Whether it's as simple as the iPhone Photos app, or as complicated as Photoshop, or as accessible as Google Docs and you create a drawing. I printed the image out here so that you can see me working on it and you can see my reference. At the same time, you don't have to do that. You can use it right off a phone or right off a Chromebook, right off a computer screen. It doesn't necessarily have to be printed out. Now please note that I'm going through here and I'm putting the values right on top of the zentangles. I'm actually ignoring pretty much 
the Zentangles, and I'm just looking for the forms of the face again so that I can get all of those lights and darks in there. I'm thinking of this in three basic values. The first value is the simplest, and that's pretty much pure white. And you can see that to the left-hand side of the photograph of my face. It's mostly my forehead and the side of my neck, a bit on my chest there. When I highlighted and heightened the lights, they became much more prevalent in this black and white version. The second then is going to be the opposite of that which is going to be almost pure black and it's as dark as I can get out of this pencil and you can see that it's getting pretty dark down here in the neck. And then the third is going to be someplace between those two and there are wider areas that where the two go one to the other, the light to the dark, and then there are thinner areas where you may not see that as prevalent. And then down here in the clothing you see that as well. I'm working on that as much as I can within the shapes that I've created, but when I made it really dark the clothing got extremely dark compared to my skin. So I'm sort of guesstimating most of that. I'm now going to show you one more tool and you'll see that it's a piece of paper towel that I'm using as a blending stump. I put it around my finger. You could use your fingers, but if you have sweaty fingers, which I don't, I have very dry fingers, but if you have fingers that have any oils on them, etc., it could ruin your picture. So I usually take and put a piece of paper towel around my finger to blend some of the values together. And just a few. Notice that when I'm doing this, I do not cross over from one shape to another. If I'm doing the ear, I do it all within the ear, I don't go into the face. If I do the lips, I do the upper lip, I do the lower lip, but I don't blend them into the areas around them. That will cause my values to become blurry and indistinct. So I use this occasionally, and I'm also going to use the eraser that you'll see here to take out a couple of highlights as well. But I use this judiciously around a lot of the areas to get the values to go one into the other. So instead of three values, now I have probably about five or six as I blend one into another. By focusing on those first three values, I was able to put in the lights, the darks, and the mediums. And now I'm making the darks and the mediums have something in between them, and I'm also making the light and the medium have something in between those. I'll then go back in sometimes and clean up a lot of the areas that seem to have sort of disappeared after I've done that, making sure that I have all the lights and darks in the proper areas. And then finally I'll take the eraser and I'll pull out a couple of highlights where I might have lost them. Another point that you may not have noticed is when I was blending one value into another, I used little circular motions with my finger rather than straight line swaths because the circular motions will create less surface line across my face. If I want to create surface line, of course, I would blend in a straight line. I'm now going to use color in the background to make this image really pop. And I, you can see that I'm doing a wet on wet wash here and I'm using those guidelines that I put down earlier. I thought maybe I would zentangle the background, but I think the color really makes this graphically interesting. With the blending colors in the background and the refined and very detailed zentangles and black and whites in the foreground, I think that gives a great contrast. You'll see that I'm doing a wet on wet wash here and these are analogous colors, colors that are next to each other on the color wheel so that when they do blend they will still be bright and harmonious. And I'm creating a rainbow that way because that's the way the color wheel works. You can see that I'm doing wet on wet as much as I can to keep that paint flowing. If it gets dried out, since this is acrylic paint, it would cause a line between the colors rather than having them blend. If this was watercolor, I might be able to bring it back to life, but it's not, so I know that I need to keep it wet and moving at all times. At this point, to make it pop just a little bit more, I'm selecting one area of my face, in this case the irises of my eyes, and I'm giving them some color, in this case some red that's a wet on wet wash just like the background. Here's my finished picture. You can see that I pulled out the highlights in the eyes at the end with a little bit of white acrylic paint. That was an artistic decision I made in the last minute. You've seen this basic process. I started with a photograph of myself for my selfie picture. I then projected it on a screen and created a contour line drawing focusing on the key features of the face. I then started zentangling those key features and flattening the space and then reforming them using zentangles. 
I then broke up the face into more geometric shapes. I was entangled within them, created a full value drawing across the surface, and then I added color at the end.